We're here to talk about one of the most extraordinary political stories of a generation, and that's the rise of UKIP. The party was founded in 1993, but took some time to take off. Nigel Farage, the current leader, was elected to the European Parliament in 1999, but by 2010, the last general election, the party gained just 3.5% of the vote at the general election. How things have changed. Our sister site, New Statesman sister site, May 2015, have recorded a five-day poll of polls that currently puts UKIP on 13.3%. That compares with the Lib Dems, who are currently on 7.5%. In some polls this parliament, UKIP have reached up to 17% doesn't necessarily translate into seats, which is something we'll be talking about later tonight. Currently, UKIP have two MPs, both Tory defectors, against the Lib Dems' current 56. However, they have three representatives in the House of Lords and 24 members of the European Parliament. They also claim that they have 40,000 UKIP members. The party has a controversial reputation. It has been dogged by claims of racism and xenophobia, and there have been a fair few newspaper exposés of its candidates. But tonight, we're going to ask where the party came from, what its supporters want, how the other parties should respond to it. And we're also going to ask the question that has perplexed political commentators. Has UKIP peaked, or is there something even more exciting in store for the People's Army after the general election in May? I'm joined by three experts to talk about this. I have Matthew Goodwin, who is the Associate Professor of Politics at Nottingham University. Uh, his book, Revolt on the Right, which is available at the back, uh, was Political Book of the Year last year, and he's widely credited as being one of the great academic commentators on UKIP. Peter Kellner is president of the polling company YouGov. He was previously a journalist and political commentator at the Sunday Times, New Statesman, Evening Standard, and elsewhere. Daphne Halikiopoulou <laughs> is lecturer <laughs> in comparative politics, specializing in nationalism and party competition in Europe. She's mostly interested in the radical aspect of nationalism. She's co-author of The Golden Dawn, Nationalist Solution, explaining the, ri the rise of the far right in Greece. So she'll be able to give us a, a more international perspective on both populism and nationalism across Europe. But first of all, I'm going to take you back in time, and I'm going to ask Matthew, just, just tell us, what, what led to the creation of UKIP, and who were the mm. personalities that shaped it in those early years? Mm. Well, going right back to the early 1990s, uh, UKIP came out of a, a movement called the Anti-Federalist League, which had been set up by an academic at the London School of Economics called uh, Alan Sked. And... You know, those early beginnings gave UKIP something that other radical right parties in Europe don't have, which is a reputational shield. And there's an argument in Europe that the, the radical right parties that have prospered the most over the last 20 years are those that have come from a seemingly legitimate tradition. And UKIP's origins in Britain's long tradition of Euroscepticism is what has given this revolt such strength. It is still seen as being a largely legitimate expression of Euroscepticism in Britain, and we might argue about candidates and statements, but those early beginnings really gave it something. Uh, Nigel Farage really didn't come onto the scene until 2006 as, as uh, leader of the party. He'd obviously been active before. Um, but it was really after 2010 that this revolt gathered pace. And we all got it wrong. You know, we all got UKIP wrong. The assumption in um, the Westminster Village was that this party wouldn't go anywhere. It wouldn't be able to take off. It was too much of an amateur organization. Um, right through to the European elections last year, when some people said, you know, UKIP will never win these European elections. They did, quite easily. And afterwards, if you remember, we then had this debate about UKIP collapsing into single digits in the opinion polls. It didn't happen throughout the summer months. They held steady, around 10 to 12%. Through the autumn months, they got two defections from the Conservative Party to where we are now, on the cusp of the short campaign, with UKIP given major party status by Ofcom. If you think you've seen a lot of them now, you're about to see a lot of them during the short campaign. And we haven't understood this party, and I think Daphne hopefully later will speak about this, that I think that is a reflection of Britain's political history. We aren't like the French, we're not like the Austrians, we're not like the Scandinavians. We haven't had a successful radical right for the past 20 years. We've not known how to make sense of it, so we've completely misunderstood its roots. I think there are two things that you say are very interesting. The first is that idea of Euroscepticism 
now being seen very much as a right-wing thing, whereas if you go back to the 70s, it was an absolutely an orthodox left-wing position. And the second is that idea about UKIP collapsing. So all these pundits who got that wrong merrily went, and of course, the SNP will collapse after mm. the referendum. And exactly the same thing has happened. They're still polling incredibly well. You know, some uh, polls have got them up to you know, nearly 50 seats. Mm. Before I go on and ask Peter something, I just want to do a quick straw poll of the room, really. Mm. Um, I'm going to say, first of all, how many of you would you say that your view of UKIP is overall positive? And how many of you would say that your view, view of UKIP is overall negative? <laughs> so, slightly you know, <coughs> tough crowd from, from a UK <coughs> perspective. <coughs> the other thing I think is uh, the request from Matthew, which is, um, uh, okay, well, uh, who is criminally indecisive? <laughs> Good. You speak for us all sometimes on that one. Um, I'd also really be interested to know in terms of, we know that you have got two MPs, we know that their, their high polling is, is very difficult to translate into seats under first past the post. Who thinks that UKIP will get more than five seats in the general election? Yeah, so about a third of you are, are, are hopeful. Who thinks that they will end up... <laughs> Fearful. Okay, put it that way. And, and, and who thinks that they will end up with, with fewer than the two that they have already? Anybody? One, oh, okay, one hopeful person, or fearful, <laughs> depending on how you feel about UKIP. Um, in which case, Peter, I, I'm interested, so we, we heard from Matthew about the, the, the build from 2010. What was the really decisive breakthrough moment in the polls? Well, the <clears throat> decisive moment, uh, well, there, there were two moments. There was the European Parliament election last May, which they won, and then there were the two by-elections. <clears throat> but let me say, Helen, that I think you've, there, are, there are two big forces at work, and actually they've been pointing in opposite directions. In terms of the underlying cause or causes of UKIP, perceptions of Europe, perceptions of, of immigration, perceptions of the state of Britain, the corruption of, of orthodox politics, that peaked at the time of the 2009 mm. European election. And since then, we at YouGov, we did a big survey at the time of the 2009 um, uh, European election, we repeated many of the questions at the time of last May's um, um, European election. Although the UKIP had gone from 17 to 27%, a lot of the underlying questions the UKIP position had actually retreated to some extent. And if you think about it, 2009, it was the worst part of the recession. That was when living standards had fallen most. It was at the very height of the rows about MPs' expenses. Labour was still in power, so the issue of Iraq and the weapons of mass destruction, the quote, lying, was much more um, upfront than it is now when Labour's not... Um, in office, um, and you had a much more unpopular government then than, than you have now. So if you look at the trajectory of what I call the UKIP cause or causes, that has been on a slight, not too steep, but slight decline over the last five, six years. But UKIP's credibility as an institution, as a party, has clearly climbed very substantially. And therefore, when you look at the votes in by-elections or in the European elections, the right in credibility has trumped the, the underlying falling cause. And, 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 and I remember, I was one of the earlier people to say I thought UKIP would win the European elections. And I thought a year or so ago they would get more than 30%. And the reason was this, that in 2009 they got 17% and the BNP had got 6%. So... This is, a, you know, this is crude, and I accept it's crude. But add those together as 23. Yes. The BNP have disappeared, got 1%. And you get 27. So if you take the two together, they've gone from 23 to 28, which is not such a big increase as all that. And I think that UKIP, and I don't know if Matt would, would agree, he will know them, but I suspect they were in the end disappointed to get below 30% rather than the 32, 33, 34% that some other polls, inferior polls, uh, <laughs> predicted, because we never did. Um, um, and I think they must have hoped for. So, um, you know, they did well last year, but it's yeah. not an unqualified well. Well, we'll come mm. back to that idea mm. about the peak UKIP, mm. which I know is a very fraught phrase mm. in many sense. But first of all, I want to ask Daphne, actually, about the, the European context. Mm. So many of the things that Peter mentioned, the financial crisis, mm. the distrust in institutions, the feeling of government happening elsewhere that you can't quite control, are not unique to the UK. 
how British is UKIP and how does it compare with other kind of hard right nationalist and populist parties yeah. across Europe? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's two ways of looking at it, right? So the one is the demand that we've been talking about. So, you know, there's an economic crisis and people have, are discontent and they want to vote for that kind of party. But if we look at it European-wide, so let's look at the e European Parliament elections in 2014 that we can compare. Um, countries that were experiencing the worst of the economic crisis, such as Spain, Portugal or Ireland, did not return a far-right-wing party at all. On the other hand, Greece did return the Golden Dawn. So, and other countries with lower levels of unemployment, such as the UK or even France, returned a far right wing party. So, I'm not sure that the economic crisis per se, or you know, these economic problems per se, can be attributed as the cause of the rise of these parties, just because there is such variation across Europe. There's also variation in terms of supply, as in in terms of what kind of party are we talking about. So, is UKIP comparable? to the far right wing parties in Europe, so is it comparable to say the Greek Golden Dawn? Probably not, either in terms of degree, so the Golden Dawn is a far more extreme, it's a violent anti-immigrant um, party whose members are currently imprisoned for you know, crimes such as murder, but also maybe in terms of, of species, is it a different type of party? Because Maybe UKIP can better be classified as a neo-populist, right? So what's uh, the closest which, analog to them in, in Europe then? I would say, well, I mean, I'm, I'm back to, you know, Matt just said earlier, and I, I jotted it down because I think it was a very interesting thing. You said that it had to be something related to the political culture and also has to be something that is considered legitimate, mm. right? And again, across Europe, so how, is, how are parties like the Golden Dawn legitimate when they are... So, the, you know, this varies. I don't know if it's that relevant to political culture, but I'd say closest parties to it were like the Swedish... Um, party or the Dutch PVV are closer to UKIP rather than the, the Hungarian Jobbik or the Greek Golden Dawn or even the Front National uh, that I, I would say are more extreme and more on the old fascist. So we come to category. this idea about actually how right wing are UKIP. So there was a feeling initially that they were taking votes away from the Conservatives. We know now that in some of those northern seats they're eating into Labour's vote. How useful is it to think of them as a right wing party? Well, that's a really good question. I think when we published the book last March, one of our central arguments was that the rise of UKIP has many big messages for the left, uh, as well as it does the right. And many in the Labour Party um, were very resistant to that message. Uh, you know, we presented the research to every political party. Okay, so Liberal Democrats, Conservatives, Labour, Lib Dem, uh, and UKIP. And, uh, I remember walking into the um, st strategy office um, in the Labour uh, Labour building and presenting all of this research to Miliband's team. Uh, and we just come straight from presenting this research to Linton Crosby, who is running the Conservative Party campaign. And Crosby had given us an absolute grilling. You know, what does that mean? How did you measure that question? How statistically significant is that? You know, wh where's your data for that? How do you le legitimate that? We went into the Labour office. Nobody asked a question. Nobody said anything. <laughs> Finished. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. And that was it. A couple of weeks later, UKIP won the European Parliament elections. They won the popular vote in Rotherham, Doncaster, Middlesbrough, Hartlepool, many parts of Wales, and then something changed in the Labour Party. And it was brought home at the Hayward and Middleton by-election when UKIP came within 617 votes of taking a northern Labour heartland. And if they had, and you'd know this better than me, if they had, I suspect Ed Miliband would have gone. Mm. I could not imagine that he would sustain. Well, you mentioned Doncaster there, which is Ed Miliband's seat, and there was an Ashcroft poll that was later corrected that had UKIP ahead, but well, for I mean, a moment there was... Total headless chicken scenario. Well, look at that. well, it's not even a poll. Look at the local elections in Doncaster. UKIP contested every single ward, won one of the wards, and finished second everywhere else. This is Farage's big gamble, that on May the 8th, when we're all still awake, having had no sleep, watching the results come in, I, I would urge you just to get a notepad, if you're as sad as me, <laughs> and count how many second places UKIP have in the north of England. So we're all talking about the SNP. That's kind of interesting, right? I mean, you know, Labour are getting obliterated in Scotland. 
and their support in Wales is down by a third. But in the north of England, you're talking about Labour seats that have not been competitive for a generation or generations becoming competitive, where UKIP candidates, simply by standing, will take 20 to 25% of the vote. That is what they call the 2020 strategy. And I'm going to bring in Peter at this point, because that is an interesting question. about. What, so what is the profile of a UKIP voter? What mm. issues are really salient to them? Uh, let me take those in reverse order. Issue saliency, a question we, you go ask regularly is, we give people a list of, I think, 14 issues, and say which three or four matter most of the country, which three or four matter most to you and your family. And amongst UKIP voters, um, immigration comes top and Europe second on what matters most to the country. Matters most to you and your family, immigration still comes top, but Europe comes, depending on the poll, fourth or fifth. Uh, certainly behind um, health and the economy, sometimes behind um, crime. So, you know, on those, uh, so immigration certainly much more than Europe is the driver. Um, but even that, I think, is we're looking at symptoms rather than underlying causes. The, I thought by far the best encapsulation of UKIP was a private eye cover before Christmas with a photograph of a, of a UKIP activist with a big UKIP rosette getting into a London black cab and the bubble from the taxi driver said, where to, Squire? And the answer was 1957. <laughs> um, and I thought actually yeah. that was UKIP. UKIP is selling a form of the past. I'm not necessarily overtly, but in terms of the kind of appeal, mate, which brings me to, as were, the, the first half of your question, who do they appeal to? They appeal um, more than any other group to older working class yeah. men. They are, um, I, to, to caricature it, it, it's the Alf Garnet vote. They're people who, who they or their families were Labour up to the 60s, 60s, 70s, went to Thatcher in the 70s, 80s. Some of them will have come back to Blair, but have now gone to UKIP. So when you ask them, when you analyse them by how they voted in 2010, Roughly speaking, half of UKIP's current supporters voted Conservative in 2010, um, and then the other half that were, a rough, of, the, of that other half, a third Labour, a third Lib Dem, a third UKIP themselves, or, or BNP, or somebody else, a handful voted Green. Um, um, so, recently, more from the Conservatives than anywhere else, but they're not, as it were, normal conservatives. Uh, they're, they're the kind of conservatives who, you'd, who, in another context, would react against a, 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 an unsuccessful conservative government by voting Labour. Yeah. Daphne, did you want, I saw you frantically nodding. Did you want to come in on that? I did, actually. I wanted to pick up, actually, on what both said. Mm. I think what, what you said, Matt, is exactly what makes UKIP mm. possible to be classified as a far-right-wing party. That's, the point is precisely that it, is, it attracts people or it puts forward an agenda that is right-wing socially and left-wing economically. And that is what makes it very similar to those far-right-wing parties in Europe. Uh, so it, it's all a question of labour scarcity or the agenda. So, you know, it's a question of the, 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 the welfare state, the collective goods of the state, the collective goods of the state are scarce, we have economic trouble. Who should have access to that? our people. So the, the, it, I, I would say it is right-wing, um, socially, well, but left-wing. Let me just yeah, quickly come, come in on that. Um, so before we, we did this book, as, as you know, um, I spent about five years studying the far right in Britain, um, you know, interviewing Nick Griffin and BNP activists yeah. and so on. UKIP is a fundamentally different kind of organisation from <coughs> those far right groups. And I, you know... <laughs> okay, got a you might not like the second half of the kick, sentence kick. quite as much. I, <laughs> I sense a butt coming. Um, it is a, a very different kind of organisation, and there is a temptation always within the uh, Westminster bubble or Westminster village, shall we say, to equate sort of the BNP with UKIP and to say, well, this is all a far right movement, you know, uh, like we've seen in, in other European states. But they are very, very different. 
Um, they are very different at the leadership level. But there is no doubt that both of those parties have profited from the same social change in Britain. And in a nutshell, um, you know, what, what UKIP is, UKIP is a symptom. It's interesting as a party, but it's also a symptom of social change in that underneath both the BNP, UKIP and abstention in Britain is the fact that you, in broad terms, have very two different groups. You've got those with the skills and the resources and the qualifications and so on to adapt and change uh, and, and, and get ahead in globalization um, and the post-industrial economy. And you've got those who have felt left behind economically, who have felt cut adrift from Westminster and are met by sneering columnists like Matthew Paris walking into Clacton and saying, you don't get what modern Britain is. Well, you know, I'm sorry, when these voters grew up, they weren't told to go to university. They were told to get an apprenticeship and work. You know, it's a very different socialization experience for those generations. And you cannot simply then just rock into the constituencies and say, you don't get modern Britain. You want to go back to 1945. And this is what I think liberal progressives have struggled with, with populists. The populist gives voters one thing. You might not like it, and it might not be accurate, and it might not be realistic. They give voters an end point. They say, this is what society can be like. And the Blairites, they could never do that. They could just say, it's globalization, get on with it, it's change. It's just constant change, it's constant flux. You either get it or you don't. There's no end point. Well, I want to pick up this idea of the end point and do a bit of kind of crystal ball gazing, because it strikes to me that if we do have an EU referendum in the next parliament, which David Cameron said he makes a condition of any kind of deal that he would do, um, either we vote to stay in or we vote to go out. And what happens to UKIP in either of those eventualities? So when, if we vote to leave Europe, ostensibly the, the rationale behind the existence of UKIP yeah. is gone. Does it, does it then struggle, Peter, does it, or does it simply recalibrate its message? Sorry, for voters to stay in? Yeah, either, yeah. either way, well, what if, does it tackle? If, uh, I don't think we'll vote to leave. If we vote to... S because we'll have a referendum if there's a Conservative government, if there's a Conservative government, Cameron will recommend a vote to stay in. That will persuade enough Conservative voters will vote to stay in. I think then it depends on what happens in the first few weeks or two or three months after the referendum. If David Cameron, because of the arithmetic of Parliament, seeks and gets an early second election, at a point where UKIP, I, I think, will be under greatest stress, then that's, that's a very dangerous time for UKIP. If there isn't a quick election, if Parliament carries through, because of fixed term rules, to 2020, then I think that gives UKIP a chance to um, regroup and redefine itself um, more broadly and uh, part of its future will then depend on what happens to the Conservative Party. I remember at a breakfast symposium three or four months ago where Bill Cash was present and I said to, to Bill Cash, supposing Bill we have a referendum and we vote to stay in, will you then, send, will you then say fair dues, we've had the vote, I accept the results? And he said of course not, I'll carry on campaigning to leave. So um, you know, I, I wonder, and I'm interested to hear Matt's view, as to whether what Farage, at some level, consciously or unconsciously, is hoping that over the next five years, precipitated by a, a referendum or otherwise, there will be a Conservative split, and then UKIP can join forces in some form with 20, 30, 40 Conservative MPs and create a new, um, much more substantial right-of-centre grouping in Parliament. Well, I mean... You know, it, here's the plan. You know, they hope Cameron pulls this out the bag. Mm. They want Cameron in. He then has to hold a referendum, mm. right? He will hold a referendum, and he has already said that with, after negotiations, mm. he will campaign for Britain to stay in. Big question mark then is what happens to those radical right MPs, uh, Holloway, mm. Hollabone, uh, you know, Bill Cash. Uh, you know, there's. 10 to 15 MPs on the back benches there who are not going to be happy with their leader campaigning to stay in. By that point, UKIP has half a dozen seats in Parliament. It tries to do effectively what the Reform Party in Canada did to the progressive Conservatives. And this is, if you want to understand Farage, 
you have to understand Canadian politics. His whole model, his whole model was like the Reform Party, get a few MPs in, and then completely tear apart the progressive, or should I say, the Cameroon conservatives, and restore traditional conservatism in British politics, and use a referendum to do that. I mean, the message from Scotland is, you can lose a referendum, and you can come out the other side a lot stronger, and you can build a movement around a referendum. And if you're interested in seeing just the scale of destruction that the Reform Party inflicted on progressive conservatives in Canada, I would urge you to go and look at the numbers. It was a first-past-the-post system, and at one general election, the progressive conservatives went from over 150 constituencies to two, right? Completely demolished the socially liberal conservatives. Now, I'm not saying UKIP are capable of doing that, but as a model for how everything we think is certain in a first-past-the-post system, it's something that I would encourage you to look at. And we look at those other hard right parties across Europe, are, are there any sense that any of those are beginning to burn out or are they also on the ascendant? Is this a general movement across northern Europe of, of, of hard right parties in the ascendant? Northern or across Europe? Northern, I'm going to say specifically no, northern, I think Sweden the, Democrats. And, okay, so I think that the, the pattern is that the type of party you see in northern Europe is more the populist radical right type of party. The different from UKIP in that if I understand, and I think Matthew can help me here with this, but so I understand so UKIP is a single issue party, so very much focused in the, on the EU, progressively moving towards becoming more all-encompassing, whereas these other parties are more nationalist far right, so there is a difference there. Um, but in Northern Europe, they are mostly on the rise. In Southern Europe, there is no rise, and in a lot of Eastern Europe, there's a decline. Okay, and then let's think about another scenario which I kind of think of as, as Lib Dem 2.0, which is we know that the deputy leader, Paul Nuttall, has been in Northern Ireland mm. talking to the DUP, um, one of the Northern Irish parties, with the potential that there is a possibility that if the Conservatives can't get over the line, you end up with a Tory, UKIP, DUP supply and confidence arrangement. Is any contact with power fatal to UKIP? Well, I mean, just before we get to that, the first question is, you know, Will UKIP have enough seats to make that possible? Now, they're going to need to win half a dozen, you know, between six and ten seats to be a real viable force. I, I, I would not like to put a specific number on it. I think they are going to struggle. There's a story breaking this evening, for example, about um, one of the parties, uh, PPCs in Folkestone and Hythe which is a great seat for UKIP. Demographically, it's in Kent, it's close to Thanet South. The candidate has been suspended uh, today, like an hour ago, for financial um, fraud. That's a big problem for UKIP, big problem. It's in, a, it's in their you know, emerging heartland. You've got massive local elections in Kent this year. You've got entire councils up for election. So can they get the numbers? Well, let's assume they have five or six seats, and then they're going to try and do business with the DUP, try and prop up, uh, prop up uh, the Conservatives. So let's just assume that that, that that scenario happens, even though it's one of sort of 11 scenarios that you can see happening. Yeah. Um, you know, always look to Europe. The, there are two assumptions that, that guide Britain's political debate. One is UKIP cannot survive after Nigel Farage. And the other is UKIP cannot survive if it goes into government. Look at Austria as a counterweight to that. Everyone in Austria, I don't know if anybody knows Jörg Haider, but um, about uh, 20 years ago, Jörg Haider was a radical right, charismatic politician. This guy was, you know, climbing up mountains. You know, he was projecting Austrian nationalism. You know, he was winning votes from the 18 to 30s. He was incredibly popular. And he led the radical right, Eurosceptic, Freedom Party, into coalition government through the 80s and the 90s. Um, was, was a very charismatic politician. Um, they got into power and they suffered uh, as a consequence and their vote went down. And then Jörg Haider died in a car crash in the early hours uh, of a morning as he was you know, a, a, a allegedly driving from one nightclub to another. Anyway, and, and died. And everybody said, well, that's it. The Freedom Party is tainted by government and they've lost their charismatic leader, much in the same way as the French said the National Front would never survive after Jean-Marie Le Pen because nobody could replicate the charisma of Le Pen. His daughter doesn't stand a chance. 
And then look at where we are today in Europe. And his daughter did, in fact, stand a chance and has won mayoral well, seats. Well, on Sunday, Marine Le Pen will probably win the first round of the vote in local elections. And in Austria, a relatively unknown guy by the name of Christian Stracker took over the Freedom Party and has taken it to being the you know, second most popular party. But interestingly, one of the most popular parties, again, among 18 to 30-year-olds. Now, it's an interesting case study in Europe for how all of our assumptions about the radical right are not necessarily grounded in empirical reality. And from your research, the profile of a UKIP voter, mm. they are most likely to be older. How much appeal do they have to younger age bands? Uh, much less, but can I just add one thing, what Matt said. Uh, and it's, oddly enough, may have been in the end to the health of the Freedom Party. Jörg Haider, as part of being f um, far right, was, was publicly homophobic. The car crash, was, he was with his boyfriend. And I didn't want to go into all the... Yeah, uh, right, no, no. <laughs> but the, the, well, the rumour is he was on of, his way to a gay club, yeah, yeah. right? I mean, it, it was, there's, uh, the, there's a sort of layers upon layers of complexity, yeah, yeah, yeah. hypocrisy, and you know, whatever, yeah, yeah. in Austria. It's really bizarre. But then Nigel but, but, Farage but, is but, married to a but, German but also, woman yeah. whilst well, saying that she but, shouldn't be allowed to live in the country. But also so. the Freedom Party was something to reaction to decades of grand coalition between the centre-right yeah, and yeah, centre-left. Sure, sure, they, sure. they formed the opposition. So there are... So what was your question? <laughs> are UKIP voters are you, old? Well, and we know that, we, we they know that they're older. What, will UKIP ever gain people down the, oh, down the, the lower down the age bracket? Do they now? No. Could they? Yes. And, and you know, I agree absolutely with Matt. That, you know, that, that, that's, although I earlier lumped in UKIP with BNP because most BNP, I mean, factually, whether you like it or not, most people who voted BNP in 2009 voted UKIP in 2014. But I agree that UKIP is a very different party. I have never called... Um, UKIP a racist party, if indeed on radio I got into a row with somebody who did call UKIP a racist party. It is a very different kind of, of beast. At the moment it has very little appeal to young voters, but I can imagine circumstances in which it, it does start to appeal. Yeah. And we talked about this idea of, them, of it not being a, a racist party. Are there people who are turned off by UKIP as strongly as there are people who obviously really, really like it? Before I go there, I just want to yeah. answer also to add about Austria that, you know, let's not forget that obviously the dynamics are fundamentally different there and let's not forget that you yourself just said mm -hmm. that it's a, 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 UKIP is fundamentally different than the, from the BNP. Now the FPO is probably mm -hmm. far more similar to the BNP mm -hmm. than it is to you UKIP. Think? So I don't know if the dynamic, well, you know, because of its... Mm -hmm. the, so I, I don't know if we need to, mm -hmm. to add a supply side interpretation mm. to the way that we're looking at it. So, you know, Austria has a very different mm. electoral system mm. that allows small parties to be part of government, allows coalitions far more mm. than they are allowed here. And, you know, that's probably different. France as well has got a very different welfare system mm. to the UK and um, a very different employment mm. benefit levels. It's a... What are the levels of immigration like in, in Austria? Um, th there it's not a question of the level of immigration mm. per se. So if you do, so in, in some work I've done, I've done uh, work on the correlation between actual immigration levels and uh, far right-wing party support, and there's no real mm. correlation. What you need to look at is perception of immigration mm. as a problem for unemployment mm. and correlation with far right-wing party support, and there is a greater correlation there. Can, so can I, can I, I, <laughs> one sure. thing, I'd like to tell you what you just said with something you said earlier about you, you said that Ireland, Spain, Portugal have not yes. had... A, but isn't this at least as much, if not more, to do with the 20th century history and the current relationship of those countries? Because, you know, Ireland has never had ideological politics, a very you know, sui generis history. Spain and Portugal are still in an era of utter rejection of the fascism of decades leading up to the 70s. And the thing about Greece, France, Austria, it seems to me, in their different ways, have never, as countries, quite come to terms with the, um, the, the, the French occupation and collaboration in the Second World War. Austria has never gone through the same process that Germany has of confronting its demons from the 30s and 40s. Greece has never dealt with the demons that brought the colonels in for a while between 67 and 74. And you're interesting about, you know, in Britain... Before UKIP, all the far-right parties always founded on the fact that Britain's cultural, political history always utterly rejected. Whether you look at Mosley, the National yeah. Front, the BNP, in the end, yeah. we extruded them. And the interesting fundamental thing about UKIP 
is that I think it's managed to locate itself in a different tradition of British politics. So I think it is culturally different from the far right on the continent. But also, importantly, and if you're pro UKIP, this is a good thing, if you're anti UKIP, it's a bad thing, it has located itself in a different British political tradition, which has made that's, it far more effective. That's a really important point, mm. and the reason that I think that's really important, mm. if you look at the Charlie Hebdo attacks mm. as one example, mm. you know, something that started in the Netherlands a few years ago mm. with Pim Fortuyn mm. when he was leading a very successful mm. radical right party, but, but made a really significant adaptation mm. to the argument, which was, you know, I oppose Islam mm. because I am a homosexual male and I mm. want to stand up for mm. the rights of sexual minorities. I want to oppose Islam because I want to stand up for the rights of women. Mm. I want to oppose Islam because I want to stand up for the rights of freedom of speech, right? Now, however inaccurate his presentation of Islam was, on the radical right, that is exactly where the narrative now is going and is where, after Hebdo, for the first time actually in UKIP's recent history, you began to see Farage talking about Britain's Judeo-Christian heritage and our tradition of Judeo-Christian values. And, you know, if this issue just becomes more and more salient, I imagine that the Netherlands 10 years ago yeah. will be a model for perhaps where British radical right politics goes. But that's slightly alarming, isn't it? Because Nick Griffin, in his later years, said the kind of things about Islam that people once said about Jewish people, this sort of mm. idea of a slightly conspiratorial way of talking about mm. it. That would be a very dangerous thing for, for Nigel Farage and Yukip to flirt with, wouldn't it? I think it would. I think reputationally, it's, very, it's a very risky trade-off for them to do. The problem is, you know, taking the academic hat off for a second, the problem is the moderate majority, the you know, the editors, the journalists, the newspapers have given a lot of space on these issues. You know, the, you take child sexual exploitation, and this is an unpopular view to express, but, you know, first came the BNP, second came the Times. No major political party was talking about that issue. And I'm sorry, that's the truth. So, we, you know, we have given political space on issues like that. And there are other issues that you can see, you know, uh, genital mutilation and others that, you know, nobody really wants to go near. And I think, you know, this evening Trevor Phillips is talking about this in his documentary about, you know, did political correctness go too far and that kind of thing. But, I, you know, there is, a, there is a question to be asked about how much space have we ceded on these issues. I'm smiling at you only because <laughs> of my always response to these things is, do you know who's been talking about this stuff for a really long time? Feminists. And just no one, no one listened to us. <laughs> I always feel that about female genital mutation. It's sort of this idea that no one talked about it. Well, actually, quite a lot of women did. It's just no, no one ever listens to them. Um, my sense, my, my personal grievance aside. I do, I do very much take your point, though, that there is a danger that if you do not have a conversation that involves everybody, you cede that ground to a particular type of person. Sorry, Daphne. Can I just add, I, I don't think it's so much the issue itself as it is the framing mm. of the issue. So it's not a question of, you know, we present a particular ethnic group differently. Pr precisely the reason why these parties are successful is that they, they frame it in ideological rather than racial terms. So it's not Muslims, it's not a particular religion. It is the fact that their ideology makes them intolerant of us. Mm. The, is, is the way, if you look at um, the manifesto of this, there's a Swiss party called the, the, the SVP, their manifesto, is, which is in English, and you can all look at it if you're actually interested, um, the first line is a misquotation of Karl Popper on toleration. And so the idea is, should we be tolerant to those who are intolerant of us? So it's not about a particular ethnic group, but it's the way that a, a particular group is presented as intolerant because of their ideology against us. And I think that's why Northern Europe far-right-wing parties are successful. So it, it's also supply, not only demand. I think this is... Uh, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a chance so that everybody in the audience has some, uh, a chance to ask some questions. We've got some roving mics that will come round. Just before I ask you that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you in a very unfair position of saying, where do you think your, UKIP will be in 2020? <laughs> you know, uh, is, it, is it Nigel Farage on a big gold throne carried through the streets aloft, or is it a party that has... <laughs> Has self-combusted in some um, way. If you had to place your money either way, I think my response to that would be to uh, would be to ask where is Nigel Farage in 2020? I mean, it's it it's going to be very, if 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 Farage doesn't win Thanet South, 
it's going to be very, very difficult for UKIP. That's the reality, and I know that probably some people in the room think that it's different and that perhaps they can survive and perhaps move on without Farage. It would be really problematic for them if he doesn't win. So, you know, let's assume, let's assume, he, uh, let's assume he does. Let's say he wins Thanet South. Then I think British politics is going to get very interesting over the next five years, and I think the Labour Party in particular yeah. is going to have a nasty shock because I don't see any response on the Labour side to two things. One is the strategic side. How do we defend our constituencies from you know, nationalist sentiment in Wales and Scotland and also Englishness in the North? But secondly... How on earth do we respond to Farage's narrative of national loss and abandonment, which is cultural and not economic? This is what Labour have never understood. You can't respond to grievances over immigration in Europe simply by talking about the GDP contribution that migrants and Britain's EU membership makes. So, you know, I think they will be in a much stronger position, assuming Farage wins than itself. Peter? Um, my starting point is that the forces that have made UKIP, are, they are the, sort of the residual or the, or the obverse of the failures of Labour and Conservative Party. And here's sort of my, my, my big ludicrous metaphor for the evening. Those of you who are roughly my age will remember the Roadrunner cartoons, Wiley Coyote. And remember one sort of standard things, Wiley Coyote runs to a cliff, runs off and carries on still horizontally for a while. Yeah. And after a while, gravity kicks in, and Wiley Koji plunges down. I think the Conservative and Labour parties, fundamentally, are creatures of the 20th century, both ideologically and in terms of their tribal appeal and the economic and social forces they represent. Um, and those have gone. The 20th century is gone, and the Conservative and Labour parties haven't changed. And over the next five, ten years, either one or both parties... Were, you know, They'll either be like John Lewis or Woolworths. They'll either adapt or they won't adapt. If they adapt, then I think in time UKIP will be forced back to the margins. If they don't adapt, then I think the kaleidoscope of British politics will change utterly over the next five or ten years. And either UKIP will be a big part of that, or UKIP marrying part of the Conservatives will be part of that. There may well be some new sort of substantially right of centre you know, in cultural terms... Um, force. And, and, and so I'm not sure whether UKIP will be part of that, but, but those will be the, that'll be the context when UKIP might thrive. Daphne, can you beat that metaphor with a better metaphor? <laughs> well, so you know they say political scientists are supposed to explain what is happening rather than predict what's going to happen. So based on that, I'm just going to try and answer it by saying, what, so I think the rise of UKIP depends on its, on its ability to maximise its opportunities at this stage and minimise its constraints. So where it will be in the future depends on, on its ability. So I'm taking a very supply-side argument, actually, on its ability to maximise those opportunities further, i.e. to pose a better alternative than the creatures of the 20th century mm -hmm. that are possibly failing to address these cultural or whatever other issues that are happening in the UK and minimise the constraints, i.e. what's going to happen with Europe, um, how the other party's going to come back and, and get them. So I, I think it's very much in their hands. On that note, I'm going to kick it open to the audience. If it, oh, wow. Well, <laughs> holy hell. Oh, wait, OK. Um, in which case, I'll say, can I send one microphone to this person on the end here, and, and I'll send one on the opposite side to, yeah, the gentleman in the orange jumper. But you first, sir, over here. Hi, good evening. Uh, I was just curious as to how much name? of... Oh, my name's Terence. Hello. Harris? Pa Terence. Harris. 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 Okay, we're, That's we're okay. Deaf up here. Um, I was curious as to how much of UKIP's rise could be attributed to its positioning as being an outsider not being part of the Westminster elite, how much of that is a factor as opposed to the economic or migration issues, the fact that it's being seen as not part of the clique that's ruled this country for so long? Mm. I'll come to you on this first, Matthew. Well, I think it's a very good question. I think if, you look at the, if you look at the broader trends that are underpinning UKIP, so you know, UKIP's electorate is the most working class electorate in British politics by quite a way. Um, to give you a sort of historical um, point of reference, 
UKIP's electorate is the most working class electorate since Michael Foote led the Labour Party. Okay? This is not a middle class conservative revolt in the shires. Um, so why is that the case? Well, if you look at the percentage of working class voters today who say, you know, I agree with the statement, I have no voice in politics. Right? That is the, at the highest level since surveys began in the early 60s. 40% of working class voters feel completely excluded from the political system. So that is why you know, UKIP is pressing those anti-establishment buttons. You know, it knows that there is a large reservoir of really alienated, apathetic, blue-collar uh, workers who just you know, do not feel that their values are being reflected back in the modern political leadership. So I think it's absolutely central. It's not everything. You know, Euroscepticism, anxiety over immigration, economic pessimism. This is what the Tories haven't understood in this campaign. Long-term economic plan. Every time they stand up in PMQs, long-term economic plan, long-term economic plan. Someone needs to tell Crosby that UKIP voters don't feel the recovery, don't expect to feel the recovery, and that's why they're not shifting back en masse. But then that raises a very interesting question. I think that underlines the challenge for Labour, because those are voters that, you know, that's... The Labour is supposed to be the party of the working class. That's where it came from. How do you fight as an establishment party with a big party machine, an anti-establishment party, an anti-politic sentiment? Sometimes you can't. I mean, you know, what's the lesson in European politics here? When radical right parties are entrenched, they don't go anywhere. Name me a country in Europe today where the radical right has emerged and then completely disappeared. Just, get, you know... I don't think you can. I'm I think, going to look at you, you know, on the basis once, you're the expert here. Once, once Eastern the, Europe, possibly. Once they're established, <laughs> in general terms, they don't tend to go anywhere. And the worrying thing about British politics, and in particular, if I was a Conservative or if I was in CCHQ, this is what I'd be worrying about right now. Immigration, if you look at the YouGov tracker, I think I'm right in saying this, immigration is the number one issue facing the country for voters. Since the 1960s, Conservatives... That is the issue they've owned, right? They've owned a few other issues, economic competence at times. Uh, Labour have had the NHS, but, but Conservatives have owned immigration. Before Christmas, something interesting happened. That changed. More voters began to say, you know, UKIP is the most trusted party on immigration and has the best policies on immigration. And what was interesting is not only did UKIP replace the Conservatives on that issue, but the numbers who said... No party has the best policy on immigration, and I don't trust any of them, that that number was higher than the number who backed UKIP. There is a fundamental disconnect on that issue, which also happens to be one of the most important issues for voters. It's a real problem. Can I say something? I, you know, I, I think the questioner, uh, you pose a false dichotomy, outsider versus economic expansion. It's both. Um, you, the economic problems, the living standard issues of the last few years have happened at a time when, because of Iraq, because of MPs' expenses, because of tax avoidance and all the rest of it, not just politicians, but the whole structure of authority is disrupted. We've been tracking now for 12, 13 years attitudes to all kinds of institutions, authority, bodies and people, and they've all declined with, with one exception, and the exception is judges. Um, interesting question as to why judges have escaped that. Um, but I think it is the, if you like, it's the perfect storm which has helped UKIP, which is they're, they're playing into economic insecurity and real living standards problems at a time when the parties are more distrusted mm. and, as I said earlier, out of date than for, uh, before. Mm. Which, which is why I would just add that I think the distinction between immigration and economy is also a false dichotomy. I think the point about immigration is precisely the economic insecurity that immigration exacerbates yeah. at a time of, of, of economic hardship. And w in, in which way do you see immigration? Because obviously we've had, you know, actually the unemployment figures are generally quite, I mean, much better than you would expect, certainly yeah. on the back of the recession that we've had, but yeah. quite good in general terms. Is it, it, is it a living standards exactly. issue, essentially, yeah. people it, feel? It, I mean, it's not only about, immigra <laughs> about unemployment levels per se. So a question of unemployment is different from a question of economic insecurity. You could be fully employed, but because of economic crisis, rising levels of immigration, globalization, etc., uh, 
if, say, um, the welfare state is limited in, in, in the country you reside or there's less provisions, you're more insecure in your job. You're more likely to lose your job and the benefits are less likely to be good. So it's not a question of... That is why unemployment levels alone tend to not correlate with far-right-wing party support. But if we look at that in, in, in far more detail and look at the benefits, look at the, the, universal, the universalism of the welfare state, then we do see a correlation. And immigration levels and perceptions that immigration is harmful for unemployment. So, so the, yeah. if, we, if we imagine in 10 years' time that immigration is far less important and UKIP has... Uh, has declined substantially what has happened and my guess is that what will have happened to produce that will have been far more houses will have been built and there's far more access both to social housing and to youngsters wanting to buy the house um, that, uh, that, that, that low paid jobs will be better paid and uh, more secure there will be more apprenticeships um, and people will feel far more confident about theirs and critically their children's futures. In other words, I think that the, the issues that cause the concern about unemployment, which in turn help produce the rise of UKIP, it is the fundamental causes that will have been tackled and it will be nothing to do whether we've changed the rules on you know, welfare benefits for people arriving in Britain or anything like that. But that does also point to a fundamental problem that you could have with the kind of coalition that they've built even within the party. So you've got people like Douglas Carswell, who was their first MP, who is, you know, he's a libertarian, essentially. He mm. av has advocated sort of an NHS on an insurance basis, more like America. Mm. That's, a, that's a policy I think that Nigel Farage has previously talked about and has now had to disown like hell because it doesn't play well. So does that not point out to the fact that that you could have already had to mutate themselves into something actually slightly more statist as they've got, as they've moved into that, that space? Well, I think like any party, you've got very different traditions within UKIP. I mean, the difference is that UKIP is a very small party, and a lot of journalists, uh, I think, are focused on, you know, a red UKIP versus a, a sort of blue UKIP, uh, a Douglas Carswell UKIP versus a Nigel Farage UKIP, you know, Trust me, you're talking about less than five individuals. This is a small party at the leadership level. You know, this is not about big camps of, you know, raving Carswellites over here versus raving Farages over here. You know, this is a small party. You know, and, it, and, and you know, as I pointed out to, to somebody recently, um, you know, Nigel, Nigel Farage has never lost an internal dispute within his party in general terms. Um, and so Carswell is, I think, reflecting more generally an aspiration among some, you know, who wanted this campaign for the general election to be about energy prices, bankers' bonuses, uh, anti-climate change, and reforming Westminster, versus Farage's instincts, which are about immigration, and the EU. And I think somewhere along the way, a decision was made, whether conscious or unconscious, that what UKIP needs to do to win half a dozen seats is probably deliver a core vote strategy. And that in order to mobilize that 15% or so who really agree with UKIP, you know, and I like to say this to sort of London ultra-liberals, you know, they are the same size as hardcore UKIP supporters. Never kid yourself into thinking that you're an ultra-majority, because there's around 15% who are raving positive about the EU and cosmopolitanism and everything. And there's 15% who are die-hard kippers. But, you know, the core, vote, the core vote strategy is what has won. Mm. And that's what we're going to see over the next month, which is UKIP delivering a core vote strategy. Thank you. I'll take your question. Sorry you had to wait so long. Yes, I'm Will. I was wondering what effect an ascendant UKIP would have upon relations between the United Kingdom and Russia. Uh, we've seen the French National Front receive huge loans from the Russian government, and recently after Nemestov's death, uh, Marine Le Pen rushed to Putin's defense, uh, as well as several other far-right European parties have called for stronger ties with Russia. Does anyone want to leap in on that one? Daphne? Okay, that's with me. I, I would say... <laughs> um, 
generally, so Russia supports these far right wing parties, right? But UKIP, as we said, is a unique, different type of thing. So I'm not sure that that would be, for many reasons, A, because of the foreign policy of the continent being different in the way that we have here, and B, because UKIP itself is not as comparable to these far right wing parties within Europe that um, are forging these relationships. With, with Russia, so I, I think it's more tentative. I think the link you're looking for there is more tentative for UKIP than it is with other far right wing parties. I mean, um, I'm sure Russia would be very happy to support the Golden Dawn and obviously a lot of other, other uh, Marine Le Pen, as you said, but with UKIP, I think it's different. Um, and on a related question, Matthew, how, how hawkish are UKIP? How do they feel about things like defence spending? I mean, scrapping Trident was in their manifesto until mm. in, in 2010, and then I think uh, Andrew Neil maybe confronted Nigel Farage about it, and he went, is it? Was it? Uh, no, 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 keep Trident, love Trident. Uh, you know, are they, are they a, a, a very defence-led party? Well, I think the last two years in uh, foreign policy have been something of a sort of open gold in a way for... UK, although I don't, I don't think it is um, a significant driver of their support. But if you look at Libya um, and Syria and Iraq, you know, UKIP was vigorously against intervention in Iraq, was uh, against intervention in Libya, and then did a you know sort of seeming seemingly sort of a, a U-turn in saying that we should allow larger numbers of refugees from Syria. Uh, Christian refugees in particular than we were doing, um, trying to tap into that anti-intervention uh, uh, mood. I didn't see much evidence that they were successful at that, but it did show that you know they were beginning to experiment with sort of new areas that they were traditionally not focusing on. And there are lots of areas where you can see, you talked about economic views earlier on. If you look at you know, UKIP sympathisers, they are closer to Labour voters than they are to Conservatives on a host of economic measures. There's one law for the rich, another for the poor. Big bankers are uh, messing over uh, ordinary workers. I'm not getting my fair share. I'm not feeling the recovery. And so there are a number of areas where you can see you know, young people not getting onto the labour market, first-time buyers getting squeezed out, generation rent, all that kind of stuff, where were we in France... That is exactly what Marine Le Pen would be talking about in a protectionist, quite aggressive way. Now, we've not seen that in British politics. I don't, don't think we will see that in British politics. But that is what allowed Le Pen to reach into the middle class and the squeeze middle class. Mm. Can, I, can I take Will back a, a brief trip down memory lane? I think you can now find it on, um, in, in, in Google on, on Hansard. A very late night adjournment debate in, I think, 1966, very late night, so it wasn't reported, the Conservative, during the Labour government, the Conservative Shadow Defence Secretary delivered a speech saying Britain should scrap nuclear weapons because Russia was a peaceful country and there was no danger of a war with Russia. It was Enoch Powell. <laughs> Enoch, this was not an aberration, he wasn't drunk. Enoch Powell, throughout his life, was pro-Russian. There is a strand of British right-wing history that always been pro-Russian. However, I don't think UKIP is actually in that, and I think UKIP, I think Farage should be out of his mind to have anything to do with Putin, and I have many views about Nigel Farage, but I don't think he's out of his mind. But, I, sorry, I, I'm, I'm going to cut mm. you off briefly mm. because I think otherwise we've only got another 10 minutes left and I wanna get, mm. I'm going to take three mm. questions at a time mm. and then maybe if there is some overlap mm. we'll, we'll deal with them better. I'm going to go front row mm. and then uh, gentleman in the, bl in the brown coat at the back after that and um, I'm going to ignore you Josh because I know you and that's <laughs> cruel that I recognise your face and instead go for the uh, lady two rows behind. Hi, uh, my name's Liz. Uh, I kind of see all the kind of recent political kind of policies being like the equivalent of gerryman gerrymandering constituencies. Like they're tweaks and like there's nothing really substantial. What would be like the populist policies that would kind of help any political party that could be implemented? You, you keep saying things about renationalizing the railways, things like that. What are the populist things that would get people in power? Okay, and then I'll. I'll hear from you, gentleman at the back. Yes, thank you. Um, I was interested by the analysis of what would be good for UKIP uh, going forward in the next five years. 
Would it not be better than Cameron getting in, that Miliband gets in, which would mean we get no referendum on the EU, as he's promised. We get probably severe economic mismanagement again. Um, and that would allow UKIP to pick off the northern constituencies, uh, which are essentially rotten boroughs in exactly the same way as we expect to see the SNP doing uh, in this election. Okay, and then if you can, we can get a microphone over there to put your hand up again, and then we can, yeah, and then we can hear from you. Yes, I, I just was, uh, this is a very simple question. I, I've, I'm an immigrant. So I've been here for 20 years almost uh, as an immigrant, and I have never felt rejected, or I have never felt racism as much as I've been feeling later on, you know. I was attacked recently in, a, in an eat shop by somebody that was uh, saying that another lady and me, that the lady was an Italian lady, they were these corrupt uh, Mediterranean people that have come here to, to, to just corrupt all this system, and, and it's quite spooky and quite scary to, to actually feel that in, in your own self, mm -hmm. you know. I, you, you were talking before about the differences between the, the countries that are suffering with, of, of the economical crisis profoundly, like Greece and Spain and Portugal, the pigs, as they call us, and how different the, the the uh, anti-establishment parties have been in those countries, which are, they, they tend to be like um, kind of left-wing parties, let's say, or uh, purely anti-establishment. Whereas here, uh, the main difference that I see from Michael Farage's party is that it's a, it's a party that comes from, from the city, because he's a, 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 a guy from the city, a, a, one of these drinkers of... Uh, whiskey in the pubs in the city in the evenings with all the mates. I mean, I work in the city. I work in the city the whole time in so which I've been. What, what do you want so to know? the question is, uh, so why, why this xenophobia, you know, from, uh, arising from, from this global, globalizing yeah. kind of forces, okay. you know, that why, what? Why, how important is the xenophobia in the race of the UK? Okay, well, I'm going I'm to give you one each on these questions. So, Daphne, I'm going to ask you that question first, which is how important is xenophobia in, in the rise of UK? It's important, but I think it's important elsewhere in, in, in Europe as well. And I'm, I'm going to stick with what I said earlier. It's a question of linking, for me, it's a question of linking the immigration question with the economy question. You know, you come from the pigs' country, I come from the pigs' countries too. And I feel the same way as well. I feel exactly the same way. But it's not unique to Britain. Greece has had the rise of a fascist, murderous party. The, the, the leading cadres of the party are currently in prison for, for murder and grievous bodily harm and other. So it's, it's, this is not unique. In fact, in Britain, it has taken a very different form. I mean, I as a foreigner too would say UKIP is xenophobic, but I wouldn't put it in the same category as a fascist party such as the Golden, not, not nowhere near, right? So these are different categories. So, um, and yes, again, I'm not sure where you're from. Was it Italy or Spain? Spain. Um, Spain doesn't have a far-right-wing party at all, and you know, Peter mentioned the, the fascist uh, Franco's legacy. I don't know if that's true. Greece also has a, a fascist legacy, and yet we have the far-right. Possibly, but um, I'm not sure to what extent. So it's, it's, I think xenophobia, to, to answer your question, I think xenophobia plays a role, but I think other things play a role too, and um, it's not unique to Britain. And possibly in Britain, it's a, it's a milder form. And, and, and Peter, I'm going to give you the question about what are these? We know that I think 66% of people are in favour of renationalising the railways. Um, are there other populist policies that, that are kind of low hanging fruit that you might expect to see UKIP go after? Oh, I was going to answer the Miliband's question. All right, I'll answer the one. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, I know, I, you always know. Um, I, the, the, the problem with pop, you know, I can list you populist policies which from our position will, will get you clap lines, and it's nationalising the railways, it's, it's denying um, um, immigrants uh, access to, to welfare, paying welfare for their family first, so two or three years, um, you know, I don't know, possibly bringing back, you know, bringing back corporal punishment in schools. You know, I, the trouble is that uh, these things in the end never really work, or, or rather, in the end, Policies are judged by whether they succeed or not. Um, 
and uh, since I don't think any of these policies, if, if, if implemented, would succeed, you know, I, th I think the, the appeal of populist politics is actually quite shallow. And in which case, I want to ask you, would it be a dream scenario for UKIP to have a Labour government to rail against and make inroads into their support? Mm. Well, I think that's, that's definitely an outcome that UKIP would uh, welcome, especially if Farage wins than itself. Um, you know, the so-called 2020 strategy is anchored in uh, the northern Labour heartlands, as you rightly point to. Um, and there are two or three factors that UKIP are hoping to take advantage of. Collapse of the Liberal Democrats in urban Labour areas that frees up political protesters that used to vote for none of the above. Um, Labour branches that have never had to fend off serious competition for generations. The toxicity of the Conservative Party in the north of England. Conservative Party is not a one-nation party, right? Just go to the north and um, ask around a little bit. And UKIP, you know, UKIP wants to emerge as the second uh, force to Labour in a lot of these seats. And I would never forget, I think, an interview with Neil Hamilton, who was a Conservative MP in the early 1990s and I think served under Margaret Thatcher, was friends with John Major. And he said, you will never believe the reception I get when I go into northern Labour areas with a UKIP rosette on. He said, they like me. They really <laughs> like me. And I said, wow, that is quite remarkable. But just very briefly, just very briefly, I mean, you know, that's something to watch when you watch those election results coming in. You keep an eye on those northern seats, Hartlepool, Rotherham, Rother Valley, Doncaster. But the, um, the, 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 point, the question about xen xenophobia, this is an unpopular view. Okay, but you know, UKIP was not the party that had go-home vans in London. It was not the party that was talking about British jobs for British workers. It was not the party that has implemented a fairly vindictive regime in the Home Office towards high-skilled migrants from outside the EU. Now, as I tweeted this morning, one of my own colleagues has been thrown out of the country for no good reason, simply because the Home Office decided that she'd spent what, two or three days outside of the country beyond the, the allowed limit. So, you know, if we're going to talk xenophobia, I'm not going to have it restricted to UKIP. You know, there is a myth of British tolerance, right? It's a myth. It's, a, it's across our political system, um, the, the things that you allude to, and it's certainly not fueled solely by UKIP. Mm. I know you want to have one final question, and then I'm going to draw this to a close. So go on, final. OK, and then you're going to get a final question as well. <laughs> Everyone gets to say one last thing. Go on, uh, one final short thought. Very quickly on that. So is it the question, and that links back to the last question that you asked, you know, where do you see UKIP? Is it really a question where we see UKIP? How many seats UKIP is going to get? Or is it a question to what extent the very rise of UKIP is able to influence party competition and the other parties? So, you know, my question, is it, is it really not about xenophobia? Is it not about the xenophobia of UKIP? Or maybe it's about the extent to which other parties try to grab votes from UK by becoming xenophobic themselves. So is, is the fear going to come from the far or is it going to come from the centre, mm. is my question. Well, I'm going to leave that one hanging and I'm going to give Peter right. the last, his last word. Big thing, uh, relating to what I said a bit earlier, the, you know, the three parties which with their ups and downs, more ups and downs over the last two or three years have, have made a big impact, UKIP, the Greens, the SNP, with each of them, I think we can all say in one sentence what they're about. The three parties that have suffered, Conservative, Labour and Liberal Democrat, can any of us say in one sentence, without referring to their history, what they're about? And, and, I, and I think that the, the, the big problem in British politics today is the traditional parties don't have a big, credible narrative about 21st century Britain. The Greens, UKIP and the SNP, like them or dislike them, agree or disagree, you know what their explanation of narrative for and solution to the problems of 21st century Britain, you know what they are. Well, on that slightly worrying thought for the main parties mm. and, and happy thought for the more fringe parties, mm. I'm going to say thank you very much to my three mm. guests who have all been fantastic and thank you to you, the audience, for being fantastic too. Mm.